Friends, my name is Ken Bailey. I am professor of Middle Eastern New Testament studies at the Ten Tour Ecumenical Institute in Jerusalem. It's been my privilege ever since I was a young boy of four years of age to be living in the Middle East, first with my parents and then working and teaching with the Evangelical Church of Egypt and then of Lebanon and now in a research institute in Jerusalem. I've served there for over 30 years in these three Middle Eastern countries. Thereby, it's been my privilege to study and try to understand deeper levels of the New Testament, its story, its messages, from the point of view of the life and culture of the people of the Middle East. I've tried to do this by reading the ancient texts, reading the Arabic and Syriac Christian literature of the early centuries, and seeing how Middle Easterners themselves have tried to understand these stories across the centuries themselves, being a Semitic people living, thinking, breathing, acting, and, and participating in the same basic Semitic Middle Eastern culture that was the culture of our Lord. Now, in this study, we wish to look at the birth story of Jesus. Our problem, when we come to stories like this one that are so well known, is that across the centuries, the story itself develops a series of traditional understandings. We must always, if we are fair to the scripture and serious students of it, keep separated the text from our interpretation of it. Our interpretation of the text is flawed. The text itself we understand and the church has affirmed across the centuries to be the unique book through which God speaks to us. And so the text we must take much more seriously than our interpretation of it. Our interpretation of it must always be open to change. Now when we come to the birth story of Jesus, we have a special problem in that this is so well known. It has been retold so many times in so many places and so many contexts for so many centuries, it has more barnacles, if you please, on it than almost any other text in the New Testament. My particular study of this text began some years ago with a question. I observed that in the Middle East, whenever a long lost son or even if the sun isn't lost, when you return to the village of your traditional origins, it's a big party. You come back, maybe you're from some village in Palestine, let's say you immigrated to Brazil or to America, to Canada. When you come back, you're identified, they ring the church bells, there's a great big party. Oh, the son so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so is back, and there's a big party. And thereby, I know that Joseph, who is of the family of David, can go back to Bethlehem and he can say, I am so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, and every home in Bethlehem is open to him. He is not only from the village, but he is a part of the most famous family the village ever had. That family is the family of David and it is such a famous family that the village is even called the city of David by some. It has its official name Bethlehem and it has this other title. Not only that, we know from the stories of the birth of Jesus that before Jesus is born, Mary visits Elizabeth and Elizabeth is, quote, in the hill country of Judea. Now that's the same place where Bethlehem is. And the hill country of Judea is not that big. If you come on a three days journey from Nazareth, it's only a, num a few more hours to any other place of the hill country of Judea. Now, if your wife is going to give birth and she has a few cousins and you can't find a place to stay, what are you going to do? You're going to go to your family. Not only do we know she has family, but we know that she is on good relations with that family and has recently visited them and they know Mary is going to give birth to a child and so if poor Joseph needs some help, uh, help and a place to stay, he of course will go to them, they will expect to take her in and everything will be taken care of in an appropriate fashion. 
Now, the third clincher of this story is the fact that in the text, and I trust you're familiar with it. If you're not, I urge you to open it and read it carefully. In the early verses of Luke chapter 2, we're told that they went up from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Then in verse 6, we're told, and while they were there, the days of her pregnancy were fulfilled. Now that's precisely what the Greek text tells us. While they were there, they were fulfilled the days of her pregnancy, is the orders of order of the Greek words. Now, you know, you've probably seen those Christmas story, the plays where the kids always enact in, at Christmas time. What happens? What happens is you read this text which says stage one, they get to Bethlehem. Stage two, the last days of her pregnancy, the last stages of her pregnancy happen while she's already there and she gives birth to her child. You read that text, then you have a play. What happens in the play? In the play, Jesus is born the night they arrive. The play is in violence of what you have just heard reading it, but nobody even notices. We are so brainwashed with the tradition which is there for, has been there for so long that we're able to read a text which says one thing, watch a play which says something else, and we don't even notice it. Now, where did we get this myth of the late night arrival birth? First of all, we don't know if it happened in the day or in the night. That's part of the mythology. But where this particular idea came from is from a ver very interesting source. About 200 years after the birth of Jesus, some Christian wrote a novel. We don't know who it was, but this novel got a title, and the title is The Gospel of James. James has nothing to do with it. We're pretty sure about when it's written, about the year 200 A.D., and in it, there are all kinds of imaginary things, some of them very, very peculiar. And in this gospel, for example, the poor fellow who wrote it didn't know very much about Palestine. He has Bethlehem, the land around Bethlehem as a desert, or the road between Jerusalem and Bethlehem as a desert. It isn't. And by this time, we have Joseph and we have his other children are with him, and they stop at a cave before they get to Bethlehem. And then Joseph goes off to get a midwife, and the child is born while Joseph is going to get the midwife. They come back with the midwife, and the midwife, in a conversation with Mary, says, well, of course, you are not now in every sense a virgin. She says, no, no, I am completely a virgin in every sense of that word. The midwife says, that's not possible because you've given birth to a child. And Mary says, no, 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 it is possible. They then have a little gynecological examination, and the midwife finds that Mary is, in every sense of the word, still a virgin. Her hand is then, the hand of the midwife, is struck with leprosy and it falls off because she didn't believe this. And then Mary reaches out and touches the hand and the hand is restored. And all kinds of other very fanciful, very peculiar, and uh, somewhat offensive things occur in that account. So in it, we have the late night arrival. The night they arrive in Bethlehem, or in this case, just outside the town, Jesus is born. Now, that novel was very widely circulated. It has, it, it has survived into the modern period in manuscript form in Latin, Greek, Armenian, Syriac, Arabic, Coptic, and Ethiopic. That means Christian communities liked that particular novel and read it. So my problem was, here were my three problems. First of all, Joseph and Mary have been in the town, the last stages of her pregnancy. Well, you've got to say at least two weeks, probably a month. And is Joseph so stupid and so inept that he can't manage anything in two weeks to a month? At least a week. And second, she's got relatives in the area. And third, he knows the names of the lineage of the family of David. He recites those, and any home in the village is going to welcome him. 
Now my problem has been, how can I take these little bits of information, two of them I know from Middle Eastern tradition, one of them from Middle Eastern tradition, two of them are in the text of the story. She has relatives in the area, and the last stages of her pregnancy take place in Bethlehem. How can we bring that together with the text and with our understanding of it? Well, the first thing we have to look at is the way that, uh, oh, first of all, we have to notice that the person who wrote this story was a person who lived in Palestine. Why? Because first of all, he says that they went up from Nazareth to Bethlehem. He knew that they were both on a ridge, but that the mountain chain went up. Second, it talks about the city of David, which is Bethlehem. If you were one of the local boys, you would know that you could call it the city of David in case you weren't a local boy and didn't know that. He helps you out by saying Bethlehem. Third, he calls it David, that Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. If you're in the Middle East, a house doesn't means a family. The house of so-and-so means the family of so-and-so. Greeks are going to read the book, and so they may well not understand that, and so there's a little bit of extra information there, the house and lineage of David. The original Middle Eastern way is first, and for the poor Greek who maybe won't follow that, the lineage, the idea of the family is put in. And then they talk about wrapping the child, which is what happens to Palestinian babies until this day, and this custom is mentioned in the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, so we know that it's an ancient custom from the Holy Lands that survived from the ancient times of Ezekiel clear up through to the modern period. So we have a Palestinian story told by a Palestinian uh, about a story that happened in Palestine. Now, we have to now look at the nature of the one-room homes of the Middle East. These are the kinds of homes that people have lived in there clear up through into the 20th century. They look like this. Here is our first chart, and we are looking now at the side of a one-room home. And so the roofs are flat, as you can see in our diagram. You can identify the door, which is on a lower level, where the family cow, the family donkey, and a couple of sheep will be brought in for safety at night. Then notice the stairs that go up to a higher level. This higher level is a raised terrace on which the family eats and sleeps, and all of family life takes place. What happens is that the farmer brings in to the lower level on the level of the door, the family cow and sheep and goat and ox, if he has one, at night and takes them out and ties them up in the courtyard in the daytime. Now, let's look at a second diagram. Here is the second diagram looking at this same house from the top. We've removed the roof and you can see on the right side of your screen the door. The door leads in now to the lower level of the house, which is the bottom of your screen. You can see the steps up to the raised terrace, which we saw also on the first diagram. Now notice the little circles, elongated circles. These represent mangers. Mangers are dug out of the lower end of the living room on the raised terrace where the family lives. This raised terrace has a little bit of slope to it so that when you wash it or when dirt falls, the dirt will gradually go down into where the animals are and be carried out. If the cow gets hungry in the night, he can, so the cow can stand up and she can get something to eat out of these mangers cut out of the floor of the living room. Okay, now let's talk about this. Thereby, when you talk about mangers to a Middle Eastern traditional farmer, his mind goes click, living room. Because, I mean, doesn't everybody have mangers in the living room? Sometimes that raised terrace is a bit too high, and the mangers are down a little bit over the edge of the terrace, but generally, you come in on a lower level, 
you go up to an upper, le upper level, and here is the raised terrace on which the family lives. Now, I've seen these homes, but do we have any clear evidence from the scriptures that these homes were the kinds of homes that people lived in in biblical times? We do. When you go back to the Old Testament, you find that one time Saul is being entertained by a lady. She's the medium of Endor, and he doesn't want to eat, and she presses him and says, you really have to eat. And the text says, she took a calf from the house and fed it to him. Okay, that means the calf is in the house. Well, a one-room home, you have a clean upper terrace with the family, the lower level where the calf would be. The calf is in the house. She kills the calf, makes a meal, and then Saul and his family eat. You may remember the story of Jephthah, who makes a promise that if he goes away to war and if he wins, when he comes back, the first thing that comes out of his house he will offer as a sacrifice to God. Now, what is he, what is he thinking about? Well, his house is an upper terrace, a lower level. The animals are kept in the lower level. He expects that as he comes back, a goat or a sheep or something like that will wander out of this lower level. But to his horror, after he goes away and wins the battle, his daughter walks out of the house. Now, he was not totally stupid. You know, for us, only people live in the house. But for him, his animals are brought in at night, taken out and tied up outside. The place is cleaned up for the droppings for the day. The animals provide the heating for the house in the wintertime. They're safe. No one will steal them. And everything is done in decency and in order. And when we come to the New Testament, we find Jesus saying, you are the light of the world. A lamp is put not under a bushel, but on a lampstand where it will shed light to all who are in the house. How many rooms are in that house when one lamp will shine into, for all in the house? Obviously, it's one room. Then Jesus, in the 13th chapter of Luke, talks to the, the heals a woman in the synagogue. The head of the synagogue gets mad, and Jesus says, look, I untied this woman. She was bent over and couldn't stand up. And you who are complaining about me, please remember, I know you untied your ox today, your donkey, and you took it out into the courtyard and tied it up because the donkey was, of course, in the house. And so why can't I untie this woman on the Sabbath when you untied an animal on the Sabbath? Now, if he had the animals in a stable, he could say, oh, I never touch the animals on the Sabbath. But everybody knows there aren't any stables. And everybody knows, of course, he has his family donkey in the lower end of his house. And so everybody knows that, of course, that's what he did that morning. That's what everybody does first thing in the morning. Thereby, we have clear evidence that these simple one-room family homes are the kind which were in the Old Testament and were in functioning in use in the New Testament, and I have seen them still in use in some simple village homes today. Thereby, we've got now the mangers in the living room. Okay, our other problem is, what about this inn that shows up in the seventh chapter, uh, the seventh verse of chapter 2 in Luke? We're told he, that after the child was born, they wrapped him, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn, say our translations. Now, the word for inn there is a Greek word. It's the word kataluma, K-A-T-A-L-U-M-A, -A -A, kataluma. This word is a special word. It's not the ordinary word for inn. In the Gospel of Luke, we have an inn. This is in the story of the Good Samaritan, where you remember the wounded man is taken to an inn. And so we have a word, and the word is pandochion. Pan means pandochion. Pan, the first part of the word, means all, and docheo, as a verb in Greek, means to receive. This is the place that receives all, namely a commercial inn. So Luke knows this Greek word. He uses this Greek word. 
And he and it's clear its meaning is clear. This is the common Greek word for a commercial inn. We have it all across Greek literature. It's such a common word in the Middle East that it's made its way from Greek into Arabic. And in Arabic you can talk talk about a funduk, which means actually the word pandochion as it has been transliterated into Arabic. The Armenian language also uses the same word that has been evolved from Greek into Armenian, such a common word that even when the Greek language was no longer used, this word came into other Middle Eastern languages. Why doesn't Luke talk about a pandochion in the birth of Jesus? He doesn't because it's not an inn. That's not what he means. Now, what does the word kataluma mean? Well, as a Greek word, it just means a place to stay. It can mean almost anything. But Luke uses it in a very special way. One other text in Luke do we find it, and that's in Luke chapter 22, verse 11, where Jesus says to the disciples, follow a man carrying a pitcher of water, and when he enters a house, ask the owner of the house, where is the kataluma? that I may make the Passover with my disciples, and he will show you a large upper room furnished. Ah, here's our key. This word kataluma in Luke 22 verse 11 is defined. It's a guest room in a private home. Interestingly, our translations of the Bible into Syriac and Arabic in the Middle East have never used the word in to translate this word. They've used also, oh, they call it menzil, it's just a kind of a common word for a place to stay. They found a common word in Greek and they used a common word in their own language, but they didn't get specific and call it an in. Luke is specific. If the word kataluma at the end of the gospel means a guest room in a private home, and Luke has another word for an in, how about following Luke's own definition and putting in the word guest room at the beginning? Try it and see what happens. Then we find that the Holy Family goes to Bethlehem. They are received into a private home. The child is born. He is wrapped and he is laid in a manger. Ah, of course, there are mangers in the living room. Doesn't everybody have mangers in the living room? But then the person who's reading the text says, well, yes, the living room is fine, but I mean, uh, that's where the rest of the family stays. For guests, lots of one-room homes will have a special room either on the roof or right beside that is kept only for guests. That's called the Cataluma. Why didn't they put them into the Cataluma? Why didn't they show them this special honor? And the text goes on to answer that question, which comes into your mind if you are a Middle Eastern reader that knows that the mangers are in the living room. And the text tells you, because the guest room was full. Oh, oh, okay, well, that's fine. You know, there's some other family, some people have come for the census. It's already full. You don't want to kick those people out just because this new family has come. And so the family that has welcomed them has shown them appropriate honor by saying, you come into the raised terrace with us. Of course, the place would be cleared for the birth of the child. After it's all over, they wrap the child. Where's the best place to put it? They don't have a cradle, so here is a kind of a dip in the floor where the child isn't going to be, uh, you know, roll over and get hurt, and it's clean, and they can put bedding there, and it's a perfect spot, and uh, so there they are. They put the child into the manger at the lower end of the living room. Every piece of our story now falls into place. Joseph goes to his home village. They welcome him. He finds a family with which he can stay. He's not driven out. His, the relatives of his wife aren't going to be upset and say, hey, why did you go to that dumb stable when you could have come to us? That problem evaporates. 
the problem of his coming to the village sometime, a week, two weeks, a month, before the child is born, this problem is solved. We don't have to say this poor fellow, he does, can't manage. No, he manages very appropriately. And we discover that Jesus, as in the case of his ministry, is welcomed by the common people. The common people, we are told, heard him gladly. Now, there's another aspect to the text that reinforces what it is we're trying to say, and that is the bit about the shepherds. Now, shepherds in first century Palestine were considered unclean. It's very peculiar to find this because shepherds in the Old Testament are a symbol of God, the 23rd Psalm. They are a symbol of the king. They become symbol of the prophets. But by the first century time, the rabbis had taken the law and they had defined it in very, very precise terms, and they came up with lists of what are called proscribed trades, trades that you won't teach to your son if you're a good Jew, because if you have one of these trades, you probably can't keep the law in a precise fashion. So of the three lists which we have from the literature of the rabbis, two of them have shepherds on them. Now why? Jewish scholarship has puzzled over this, how a symbol of even God himself in the Old Testament by the time of the New Testament could become a symbol of a trade that a good Jew really shouldn't follow. And their answer is, well, if you are a shepherd, first of all, you're leading your sheep outside of the Holy Land. There is danger of you becoming defiled by dealing with the Gentile. But more than that, they said, if you are going to repent, you have to make compensation for all your mistakes. So this poor shepherd, his sheep are going along on the path. They keep wandering off into various people's wheat fields and people's clover fields and nibbling on all kinds of crops they shouldn't be nibbling on. So when this poor shepherd comes to repent, he can't fully repent because he doesn't have the list. He doesn't know, well, I owe Joe something and John something and Bill something and Al something. No, he hasn't got the full list. He can't make full compensation for his mistakes. And so this poor fellow can't repent. Therefore, if you're a good Jew, you want your son to observe the law in a precise fashion. Don't teach him to be a shepherd. Now, with this background, we notice that the first people who hear the message of the birth of Christ are shepherds. That's not a mistake. They get the word, and so do the wise men who are at the top of the level. These are men of influence, of wisdom, of wealth, and we can presume of influence. So folks on the top of the sociological scale of the Middle Eastern society have a message, hear the message, and those at the bottom. And also, the Jews are given the message through the shepherds, and there is a Gentile witness because these people have come from afar. But we're talking about the shepherds. They hear the message. The angels tell them of the birth of the child. Now, they're scared. They don't want to go. Why? Because, well, if this child is truly what the message of the angels say he is, the one who will bring joy and peace to the world, then they're not going to be welcomed. I mean, you know, they're shepherds. Somebody is going to say to them, Ugh, tradesman to the back door, please. He's going to be born in some fancy home. No, the angel says, this will be a sign for you. You will find the child wrapped. Oh. That's what we do with our kids, we villagers. And you will find him lying in a manger. Oh, you mean he's going to be born in a one-room home like ours? These are not going to be those fancy rich folk that are going to say tradesmen to the back door. He's born into a home like our homes. Maybe they'll let us in. The shepherds go, they visit the holy child, 
And then what do we find? We find to our surprise and delight that they are pleased with the quality of the accommodations. Now, how do we know that? Well, look ahead in your text in the second chapter of Luke, and you will find it says in verse 20, and the shepherds returned, that is, returned to their sheep, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now, I live in the Middle East. I know that my Middle Eastern friends have tremendous ability to show honor to guests. And they have a tremendous, very finely tuned sense of how you show honor to guests. Now, what if these simple shepherds had shown up and found this mean old innkeeper who had said, no room at the end, sorry, fellas, there's no place for you. Well, I've got this drafty stable at the back here, and if you want to use that, well, it's not very clean, and there's a lot of manure around, but you can go back there. If they had showed up and they had found that, driven out, nobody welcomes them, no really adequate shelter, they would, as Middle Easterners and as human beings, have gone right through the roof. They would have said, what's going on here? You folks, quickly come home with us. We can do better than this. They didn't. We're told that they went home praising God for all that they had seen and heard, and this included the quality of the hospitality. So in a sense, here is the capstone to our story. These humble shepherds are given this special sign. This child is born for the likes of you. And that means in a very special way, folks, he is born for the likes of us. The humble, the outcast, the broken, the needy, those who have a low self-image, those who feel they really can't make it with that high-class society, those who are in a sense shut out, there is a special sign given to them. This child comes for the humble, the lowly, and the meek, like you. He also comes for the rich and the wise who come with their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh. And do you remember the story of the wise men? It says they came to the house. Of course, he's born in a house, no problem. You don't have to dream up some new chapter which says, well, finally, some poor soul came along and welcomed them into a house, and all of this time has gone by. You don't have to add that. The story in Luke says he's born also in a house. Now, folks, I find this way at looking at, these, at the text not only is it faithful to the text itself and strips away those layers of mythology that we have dreamed up in our traditional understanding of it, not only does it help us get to, way this, to the way the story really happened, it enormously enriches us. It enriches the story, it gives it an extra cutting edge and a punch. Yes, we're going to have to rewrite a few of those Christmas stories, but in the rewriting of them, we will find new and tremendous theological content about the Christ child who was born to a humble family, into a humble home, welcomed by the simple people of Bethlehem, praised by the outcast shepherds, for as he came to the common people, the common people welcomed him. And as he grew to manhood and began his ministry, the common people heard him gladly. Don't hold on to those myths. The story of the late night arrival from the end of the second century isn't an essential part of the story. It's a part of the mythology that crept on around the story. Rediscover it from a Middle Eastern perspective with me as we allow the original telling of the story intended by the original historical event as mirrored in this inspired writing of it to refresh us, renew us again at Christmas time. There is a sign 
and the sign is the sign of being born in a manger. Look at the diagram again of this same one-room home. There we are. There is the place where the animals are brought in, in uh, and for, at the nighttime. And there is the raised terrace. And there are the mangers in the living room. What does this then mean for us? It means that we, like the shepherds, can come with this same sign, knowing that he, the Christ child, is welcomed into a simple home. And we ourselves will not be rejected, irrespective of who we are. We can be welcomed at that same manger side, and we too can welcome that same Christ child afresh into our own hearts.